Good morning, mommies. Welcome wherever you are. If you're via internet, in homes, or just in your own home, welcome to the home club. We're so excited that you've joined us. If you've been with us for the last several weeks, you know that we've been talking about who am I and what about me. We're in the fifth week of our series and talking about who am I and what about me. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how your mommyhood is a season, that the hours go by slowly, but the years fly by. We also talked about that motherhood is a season of a very high calling. You literally have such a short time to train your children. And remember that we're heart shapers and we're also makers of memories. And the other part of this whole important part of being a mom is that you're in a season right now, but it's not going to last forever and you don't get any do-overs. So be present in what you're doing right now. And then two weeks ago, we talked about how millennial moms sometimes have more of a challenge because of the way you were brought up in having so many of the niceties for you and not learning how to really navigate life in the way that you need to right now. But remember, you can change what's happening to you to now. We talked about your purpose over being perfect. And if you remember, we talked about that when we're in perfection, we're so much about performance, which creates anxiety, or we just give up and procrastinate and it causes depression. But if we're in our purpose, then we know that we're going to be present. And when we're present in our situation, we have so much more peace, don't we? We have so much more peace. We also talked about Last week, mirror, mirror. And if you remember, we talked about when you look in the mirror, not when you have like, I'm all dressed up today. And so I have a lot of coverings on. But when you look in that mirror, when you're just you and God, what do you see? What are the lies that you're believing? And then what are you reflecting? When you leave that mirror, what lies are you taking with you that are being projected out there? Because remember, our children learn by what we do and not necessarily by what we say. And then we also talked about if you want to change your legacy and change what your background or what you believe, then get real with God and ask him to show you the lies that you're believing so that you can reflect what you want to. Because God is a healing God and he wants you to be free. And today, we're going to be talking about how do we cultivate a heart of contentment. I don't know about you, but that's not something that comes easy for me. But before we go to contentment, let's go to the Lord. Father, we're so grateful that we get to meet together. More than anything, Lord, we are so grateful that you are a God who loves us, who will never leave us, never forsake us, and that you've given us everything that we need. Father, I pray that as we talk about contentment, that each one of us would be challenged to think about what are we participating in to prevent us from truly living a contented life. So Father, take off those scales and reveal to us what we need to see so that we don't walk through life with just so much grumbling and complaining. We want joy and we want you to change our hearts, Lord. So let it start with me. And we ask all this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Today, we're going to be talking about three parts of contentment. Why most of us really are discontented and unhappy a lot of the times. We're going to talk about what is true contentment? How is it different from being happy? And then how do we cultivate a heart of contentment? Because it is not something we're born with. We are born selfish. All you have to do is witness a brand new baby. And if they don't get what they want, what do they do? They scream. And we're in adult bodies. And what do we do? <laughs> we just scream in a different way when we don't get our own way. So remember, why, why does it elude us? What it is? And how can we cultivate it? If you look around, I think many of us are unhappy with so much around us. I mean, you look at our political system, you look at our schools, our government, our families, 
everywhere we look, we can have a real feeling of being discontented. And then we come back to ourselves and we, well, if only I had, or if only this was different, or when, then I'm going to be content and happy. Don't we all say that? We all have this idea that it's going to be another time that we're going to find that happiness. And the thing that happens is that contentment is something that is truly cultivated. And it was interesting. There was a study that was done over about a three-year period. And all the subjects were to record their contentment or happiness level on a scale of one to 100. And they were to record it every couple of weeks, record it when life was just normal and mundane. Maybe if they had gotten a new car, or a new house, maybe a relationship, or maybe they were pregnant or, or had a child. Whenever something that they truly desired, they were also supposed to mark what was their contentment level. But everyone started with a baseline. So they ask everyone in the study, right now when life is normal, what do you feel your contentment or happiness level is on a scale of one to 100? It's going to surprise you what happened. Yes, there was an increase when somebody got whatever they desired or attained. If it was success or a child or whatever, their, their contentment level spiked. But do you know what happened? Every single person's contentment level, when all the newness wore down, they returned to their baseline. Some of these people, their baseline was not very high. They were basic life, maybe a 10, others, maybe a 60. But the thing I find interesting is that every single one of them returned to their baseline. That's encouraging to me because that makes me really believe what God says in his word, that we can develop contentment with him. So I ask you right now on a scale of one to 100, how would you rate your contentment? You're pretty low? Why? You're pretty high? You probably have a close relationship with the Lord because he's the one. Remember, he gives us that hole in our heart that we try to fill with everything out there. We try to fill with stuff or with success or with whatever, but it's God who puts in our heart what we need. He created us and we're more fulfilled and more contented when we're living and doing things God's way. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But wouldn't you want to say, well, I mean, that's all good, but I really would be content if, you know, I mean, if I had a really great family, if, if I came from a great family, life would be just so much easier. Or, you know, if my husband was just a little different, then life would be pretty good. Or if my relationships were better with other people, I'd be more contented. And remember, all those are based on our circumstances. Every single one of those. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, it says, be joyful always. Pray continuously and give thanks in all all your circumstances. Now, it doesn't say give thanks for your circumstances. We don't have to give thanks for them, but we are to give thanks in them because God is doing a work in us when our circumstances are not what we want them to be. He's doing a mighty work in our hearts to change us because if we had everything we wanted, we wouldn't need a savior. And so you have to ask yourself, why did Jesus go to that cross for us? He went to that cross that we might be free. Remember, he said, I came to set the captives free. And if we believe that when we have all the stuff, we'll be free, you're believing a big fat lie because it's not true. There was another study that was done about what is the American dream for you? What would it take for you to have the American dream? And they, they did all socioeconomic levels. And every single person that was interviewed always stepped it up just a little bit. If you made 50,000, you wanted to make 55. If you made a million, you wanted 2 million. And every person, when they attained that next level, they were never satisfied. Because remember, 
gimme, gimme, gimme only wants more gimme, gimme, gimme. But give, give is when we pour our lives out to other people. That's when we have true contentment and happiness. So don't believe the lie that right now, if you are experiencing maybe financial issues or relational issues, family issues, that you can't have a contented heart. You know, and, and it's fall now and we're all going to be going to holiday, holiday places for family. And we really need to do work with the Lord right now so that we bring contentment and joy to our situations and not expect our families to give that to us. So what's the moral of the story for contentment? We do try to fill it with all kinds of stuff. But Socrates 2,500 years ago said, he who is not content with what he has would not ever be content with what he would like to have. Think about that. Think about what that says. He who is not contented with what he has would not be contented with what he would like to have. That's 2,500 years ago. There's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. Remember, we have this hole in our heart because of sin. So if we want to live free, then we need to do it God's way. You might ask yourself, then what is contentment? How is it different from being happy? I, I think of happiness as circumstantial. You know, I'm happy if I have a nice dinner with my husband, or I'm happy if my kids call me, or I'm happy if. Contented means, you know what? I'm grateful we get to go out to dinner, or I'm grateful that we have dinner at home, or I'm grateful that my children call me versus you haven't called me. I'm contented when I am given a gift. And there's a difference between all these expectations versus a thankful heart for whatever we have before us. And if any of you have studied the Bible and know about Paul in the Bible, Paul was a, a guy who went through everything. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was stoned. He was put in prison. And I want to read to you what he wrote from prison. I want to read to you what he wrote from prison. He was in chains. He was not a free man. And this is from Philippians 4. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all because the Lord is near. Then he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and thanksgiving, present your request to the Lord and he will give you the peace that transcends all human understanding to guard your heart and your mind in him. Now, why do you think I've memorized that verse? Because contentment was not something that came easily to me. My husband told me when we were married after maybe five years that I was the least contented person he had ever met in his life. And I didn't even really understand what contentment was. It was like, well, how can I be content? I have three kids under three years old. You're working all the time. And how can I be contented? But God put me on a journey. And I started studying what contentment was. And do you know that there's over 365 verses in the Bible about joy and, and joy, which is contentment? So I think there's no accident that the Lord wants us to really dig deep into his word, to really learn about what is joy and contentment in our life. It's not circumstantial. It's a gift that God gives us. And then the next part of what Paul says, which is just think about it again. He is in a dungeon probably. I mean, it's probably stinky and cold. He doesn't know at this point in his life if he's going to live or if he's going to be beheaded. He has no idea what his future holds. Think about that for a second. And this is what he writes. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. 
I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, rather well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want, because I, you, me, can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So what prison are you putting yourself into right now? What prison of lies are you living with? What is making you captive? Do business with the Lord and ask him to free you. He will. You just need to ask him. You need to say, Lord, I don't want to live believing that I will win. I want to live now. Do you know that if we are emotionally present in our circumstances, that we have more peace, that we have more presence, it, it literally allows us to walk through it in such a gentle, loving, gentle, kind way with other people. But when we're living in that prison, what happens? Everyone around us becomes prisoned as well because we deliver that on everyone else and especially on our children. I know you're tired and you're hungry and you think this season's never going to end. You believe that lie and it's not. Your kids are going to be gone before you know it. So as we've talked about through these other weeks, what can you let go of? What part of your season right now do you need to embrace so that you can rejoice and give thanks? So that you can say, I will walk through this season with the Lord. And I think it's so interesting that God gives us four seasons because I think it's such a, such a picture of our life. You know, there are times when, for me, I love summer. So summer are those long days that I love. But you know what? You can't have spring without summer, fall, and winter. So I don't know what season any of you are in right now, but ask yourself, what season am I in? Am I in summer where I feel like there's just long, glorious days? Or is it just kind of in this fall season of, I don't know what's ahead? Or maybe you're in winter where things are looking pretty bleak. But no, spring is coming. God wants you to know that he will bring you through for a harvest of contentment if you do work with him. I love a quote that Martha Washington said. Now remember, Mar Martha Washington was married to George Washington, who she never knew if he was going to be dead or alive. She never had children. And they literally went through so much of the founding of our country. But this is what she said. The greater part of our happiness or our misery depends upon our dispositions, our dispositions and not our circumstances. So what's your disposition when you don't get your own way or things aren't going the way you want them to do? Are you trusting God to say, Lord, you change me. Will you give me peace and joy and contentment? Or am I just going to have a disposition of, <laughs> no, I'm not going to cooperate. It's your choice. But when we do it God's way, it's always better. So remember, contentment is not having what you want, but wanting what you have. There's different seasons in life, so embrace the one that you're in. And pray for the situation, if it's not what you want, for God to work through it. Because he's always teaching us things in our circumstances always. We learn so much when we're going through the fire. That brings us to our last point. How do we cultivate a heart of contentment? Do you think you can? Do you want to? You can. I told you I was the least contented person I had ever had my husband meet. And I can say that today, I mean, I still struggle but I am learning, I am learning the joy of contentment. When things don't go my way, when I don't get what I want, 
for me, I, I have a, a lie that I should have my own time. I don't know what your lie is, but for me, it's, well, I just need my own time to do blah, blah, blah. And I don't have a lot of time to do what I want to do right now. But I need to ask myself, am I going to do what God's called me to do and be steadfast? Or am I just going to complain and go, oh, this just isn't fair. Why does everybody blah, blah, blah? Or am I going to say, Lord, thank you. I'm going to rejoice. Again, I'm going to rejoice and give thanks for the privilege of whatever you allow us to do or to have or not have. Because contentment is a mindset. It's, it's really what you believe about God. It's what you believe. Is he a good God or is he a God that holds out on you? And I used to believe that God was a God that held out on me. And I've learned now that he's not a God that holds out on us. He is a God who created us and knows how we are to live contentedly. I used to think the Ten Commandments were just like, oh, yeah, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, or thou shalt. I always used to think that they were just rules that were just no, so unfair. But when you look at every single commandment, they're for our protection. Every single commandment. We don't have time to go through them all today, but I want you to read them. Go to Exodus 20 and read the Ten Commandments and then ask yourself, why is it that God has commanded me to do this. When it says, you know, thou shalt not covet what other people have. What happens when we covet? We're miserable. He knows that we'd be miserable if we covet something else. Or thou shalt not steal. Why does he say not to steal? Because we have property rights. God gives us certain things that we have that are ours. And when we're stealing, we're taking from somebody else. And God wants us to steward what we have and not take from somebody else. And you can go through every single commandment and every single one is for our protection. So remember, contentment is a mindset. If you remember the study, if people's baseline was low for contentment, they may have had a spike, but they all returned down to their normal level. So ask yourself, where do you want your baseline to be on a scale of one to 100? And what do you need to do to change that baseline? So ask yourself right now, how content are you with your life circumstances? Whatever's going on, in, how contented are you? Scale of one to 100. How content are you with what you have or don't have? And then, how content are you with your relationships? Many of you have young babies, and, and marriages are a little bit tougher when you have new babies. But again, it's not going to last forever. So you ask yourself, what can I do? What can I do right now to embrace the circumstances I'm in? Or what can I do to change my circumstances? And most of the time, it's a mindset change of embracing what God has allowed for you to walk through at this time. And remember, God says, I make the rich rich and the poor poor for my good purposes. So if you feel like you never have enough, really ask yourself, is that true? We are blessed in America. We have so much. Don't, no matter how little money you have in America, you do not go hungry. So ask yourself, how happy are you with what you have? And then in your relationships, how contented are you? What can you do to change? And we always do this talk right before we start talking about marriage next week, because we always think, and I still sometimes believe, if my husband only, then I would be very happy. But you know what? God has taught me I'm the one that needs to change and then my husband will change. You know, your husbands are not sitting around 
learning all of this stuff. They're out there working hard, trying to make a living, and they don't have the same kind of encouragement that a lot of women get to have. Now, I know many of you are out there working and doing your best. You are too, but you have the ability to take in emotional information to change a lot more than most men do. We're just wired differently. Now, if you're married to a man who's more emotional, then that's wonderful, but most of us aren't. So ask yourself, what lies am I believing about whatever circumstances I'm in with what I have or don't have or my relationships? And then I want to leave you with four C's. These four C's help me to remember how I'm living in contentment. How am I doing? And these are the four. If you want to live a contented life, don't compare, don't criticize, don't complain. And the one I forget is usually the one I'm dealing with. And it's don't compete. Hmm, I'll have to think about that one. So let's take the first one. Don't compare. God calls us to be content with what we have. And in 1 Timothy, it says that godliness with contentment is great gain. Again, God gives us that because he knows that if we are happy with what we have and we're not comparing ourselves to others, we have great gain in all of that. So where are you comparing yourself? You can be comparing yourself with your children and how well they're doing or they're talking or they're crawling or the kind of house you have or the car you have, whatever it is. Instead of doing that, say, Lord, thank you for what I have. Rejoice. Give thanks. The best antidote for discontentment is praise and thanksgiving. That is the best antidote. And that's why the whole Bible is filled with praise and thanksgiving. Number two, don't compete. Be happy for others' success. A heart at peace gives life to the body. But do you know what envy does? It rots the bones. It's biblical. Have you seen people that are competing all the time? I mean, they literally rot inside because they just are trying to get something that they'll never attain. And then pride only breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found in those who take wise advice. So if you're competing, really think about it. It's, it's pride. And God says, pride comes before the fall. So think about who are you competing with and why? What is it in you that is so wounded or so hurt that you feel like you have to compete? We all do it, but God wants us free. Remember, we want to be free. We don't want to be captive. The third is don't complain. Oh, this one was so hard for me because when my kids were little, Dirk would walk in the door and go, do you know what happened? Or even today as we're trying to do videos or doing all this other stuff, I go, Dirk, do you know what happened? And he just looks at me like, what now? And then it's like, no, Lord, we're going to walk through this with, with gentleness and kindness and compassion instead of with a frenzy. So what are you complaining about? And this was a Bible verse that I had my children memorize when they were little, and I had to do it too because this was not easy for me. It says, do all things. Now, it doesn't say some things. It says do all things without grumbling and complaining. Now, again, why do you think that's a Bible verse? Because God knows our nature. So we are to do our work as unto the Lord without grumbling and complaining. And be thankful for the work that you have. You know, and maybe you're at the point where you go, I'm so tired and I'm so stressed. You know what? Thank God that you have arms that work or a brain that works or a warm house to be able to even be complaining in and say, Lord, will you change my complaining to gratitude? And write Bible verse all around your house is to remind you. And then the fourth one, and this one is very hard for most women. It's don't criticize. We are so wired that we tend to see so many things. So we are very critical. And unfortunately, most of us are critical of our husbands. And when we're critical of our husbands, they start to believe what we believe about them. 
So think about how can you encourage your husband instead of criticizing him? Because it says in Proverbs, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh critical word stirs up anger. We tear our own house down with our own hands. And then in Ephesians, it says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Now, remember, it doesn't say according to our needs. It's according to their needs, to build them up according to their needs, that it may be benef beneficial to those who listen. If you're building somebody up and you're talking about the good of what's in them, it just brings more peace. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be talking about things that aren't pleasing and things that may need to change, but we don't want to have a critical spirit. And I have, I can have a very critical spirit. I have to work on it constantly. But whatever you have to work on, if it's competing or comparing or criticizing or complaining, did I say the four? Do work with the Lord. Do you want these Bible verses? They'll be in your handouts. And really write them out. Put them in your house. Put them wherever you need to. If you don't have a lot of joy, then put on music that will bring joy to your, your house. If you're not happy in your circumstances, then say, okay, what can I do? Because many of us have so much junk that we can't even find anything. So we go out and buy more junk because we think we need it because somebody else has that junk. And yet we have so much junk already in our house that we're so overwhelmed and just overstimulated. And the same for our kids. Keep life simple. Keep life calm. It helps your children so much more. It helps your husband. Visual rest is something that you can create. So I encourage you to do that. So I'm going to just leave you with this. Remember that contentment is cultivated. And what do you have to do when you cultivate something? You usually have to dig up. You have to dig up the, the soil. You got to break it apart and you've got to get it ready for the planting. So ask the God, ask the Lord, what do you need to dig up that's preventing you from having contentment? What do you need to throw away? What lies do you need to throw away? What situations do you need to let go of? Now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't want to give you the desires of your heart. He does. But ask him, start to journal. Cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, you know right now we're having financial issues and I don't know what to do. Will you teach me how to be a better steward of what we have? Do you know he'll show you? Maybe it's in your relationship with your husband. Lord, I don't know how this marriage is going to work. I just don't know. But Lord, you say that you will change me. So what changes do I need to make? Because remember, we can always blame somebody else when we get divorced. But guess what? It took two to get married and it takes two to get divorced. So what do you have to do to change? And pray for your husband that God would start to reveal in him what needs to be changed. With your children, what are you holding on to? What are you holding on to? Maybe they're like a relative, or maybe you're not happy with how your children are. Be thankful for your children, every single one of them, for the personalities, for the deficits, for the challenges. Thank the Lord, because he is using your children and your husband not to make you happy, but to make you holy. And those children are in your life to reveal, again, that mirror that we talked about last week. So don't blame anybody else. Again, like we talked about last week, look in the mirror and say, what can I do to change? And that leaves me with the last that I want to say. If you want to have contentment, I, I think there's three keys. One is, instead of complaining and doing all that other stuff, is to thank God. It's also to forgive. 
when things are not going your way, for you to live a life of forgiveness. And also for you to know that there are seasons in life, just as there are seasons in nature, and that you would embrace the season that you're in and ask God to change what needs to be changed and then know that another season's coming soon. So God bless you all. I hope you have a nice small group time. Or if you're looking online, you can email us and we'll send you the handouts. Or you can contact us or you can call me, Sharon Johnston, 704-654-9966. Thank you all. Love you.